Next, I want to talk about how do we train uh, graph neural networks, right? So far we talked about how do we augment the feature vector of the node and how can we augment the graph structure. And we talked about how to augment the graph structure by adding edges to improve message passing or how do we drop edges to increase the efficiency, especially in natural graph social networks where you have high degree nodes, you don't want to aggregate from the entire neighborhood of the node, but you want to kind of carefully subselect uh, the part of the network to aggregate from. So uh, this is the reason uh, why you want to do these augmentations. Now I want to talk more about how do you do the training? How do you deal with the outputs? How do you define uh, the loss functions, measure performance, and so on? So the next talk is um, how do we train a GNN, right? Like what kind of learning objective do we want to define? And um, how are we going to uh, do uh, all this uh, together? So GNN training pipeline has the following uh, steps, right? So far we talked about the input graph. We talked about how to define the graph neural network. And we talked about how the graph neural network produces node embeddings. What we haven't talked about yet is how do you get from node embeddings to the actual prediction? And then once you have the predictions, how do you evaluate them based against some ground truth labels? And how do you compute the loss? Or how do you define the loss, the discrepancy between the predictions and the true labels, right? Um, so far we only said, aha, uh -huh, GNN produces a set of node embeddings, right? Which means that this is a representation of node L at the final layer, layer L uh, of the graph neural network. And I can dis think of this as, you know, some representations, some vectors attached to the nodes of the network. Now the question is, uh, you know, how is this uh, second part defined? What do we do here in terms of prediction heads, evaluation metrics? Where do the labels come from? And what is the loss function we are going to optimize? So let's first talk about the prediction head, right? Uh, prediction head, this means the output of the, G of the, of the final model, um, can have we can have different prediction heads. We can have node level prediction heads, we can have uh, link level, edge level, as well as entire graph level prediction heads. So let me talk about uh, this uh, first. So uh, for prediction head, the idea is that different tasks require different types of uh, prediction outputs, right? As I said, we can have an entire graph level, individual node level, or um, edge level, which is a pairwise between a pair of nodes. So for node level prediction, we can directly make prediction using node embedding. So basically after the graph neural network computation, we have a d-dimensional node embedding uh, for every node in the network. Um, and if, for example, you want to make a K-way prediction, which would be basically a classification of nodes among k different classes or k different categories. Um, this would be one way, or perhaps you want to regress uh, against 10, uh, sorry, k different targets, k different uh, characteristics of that node. Uh, the idea would be quite uh, simple. We just say, um, you know, the output uh, head of uh, for a given node is simply some uh, matrix times the, times the final embedding of that node, right? So this basically means that W will, will map node embeddings uh, from this embedding space to the, to, the prediction, uh, to the prediction space, to the, in this case, let's say, k-dimensional output because we are interested in k-dimensional um, uh, prediction, so a k-way uh, prediction. Um, in order, one more thing I will add for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to use this hat symbol to denote the predicted value versus the ground truth value, right? So whenever I use a hat, this means this is a value predicted by the model. And then I can go and compare Y hat with Y, where Y is the true, true label and Y hat is the predicted uh, label, right? And now that I have Y hat, I can compare it to uh, y and I can compute uh, the loss, the discrepancy between the prediction uh, and the truth. This is for node level tasks. For edge level tasks, we have to make a prediction using pairs of node embeddings, right? So again, suppose we want to make a k-way prediction, then what we need is a, is a prediction head that takes the embedding of one node and the other node and returns uh, y hat. Now y hat is uh, defined on uh, pairs of nodes. This would be, for example, for uh, link prediction. So let me tell you what are some options 
for creating this uh, uh, edge level ahead uh, for prediction. So one option is that we simply concatenate uh, embeddings of nodes u and v and then apply a linear uh, layer, a linear transformation, right? And uh, we have seen this, uh, this idea already in graph attention, right? We said when we computed the attention between nodes u and v, we simply concatenated the embeddings, passed them through a linear layer, um, and that gave us uh, the prediction of the attention score between a, a pair of nodes. Here we can use the same, the same idea, where basically we can take the embeddings of u and v, concatenate them, basically just join them together, and then apply a linear predictor on top of this. So basically multiply this with a matrix and perhaps send through a non-linearity or anything like that, like a sigmoid or softmax, if we like, right? So the uh, idea would be that um, the prediction is simply, um, you know, it's a linear function that then takes the um, H1, uh, H of u and H of v, concatenates them, um, and, up, and maps this uh, uh, 2D dimensional embedding into a k-way uh, prediction or a k-dimensional uh, output. Another idea, uh, rather than concatenating, is also we can do uh, a dot product, right? So we basically say our prediction between u and v is simply a dot product between their embeddings. If I simply do the dot product between the embeddings, then I get a single scalar output. So this would be a one-way prediction, like link classification or link prediction. Is, the, is there a link or not, right? So basically just a um, one variable kind of binary uh, classification. Now, if I wanna have a k-way prediction, if I wanna, for example, predict the type of the link and I have multiple types, uh, then I would basically have this kind of, uh, uh, almost similar to this kind of multi-hat prediction, where basically I can have a different uh, um, uh, matrix uh, W that is trainable, um, and I have one for every output class, right? So for every uh, output uh, class, I would have a different uh, matrix W that essentially the way you can think of it is it takes, uh, let's say the vector U, and then it transforms it by uh, shrinking or extending, rotating and translating it, and then uh, multiplying that, that with a H of uh, V. So it's still a dot product, but the input vector gets transformed, right? And um, every, every class gets to learn its own transformation, how to basically uh, rotate, uh, translate, um, and, and shrink or expand the vector so that the dot product um, is, uh, is uh, such that the, predict that the, value, the output values uh, are, well, um, are well predicted. And then, right, once I have a prediction for every of the classes, I can simply concatenate them, and that's my final prediction, right? So for k-way prediction in binary, just to summarize, I can define this matrix W, one per output class, and then learn this type of uh, uh, linear uh, predictor based on uh, dot product. And then uh, the last thing to discuss is how do we do uh, graph level uh, prediction, right? Here we want to predict using all the node embeddings in our graph, right? And again, let's suppose we want to make a k-way prediction. So what we want is we want to have this uh, uh, prediction head that uh, makes one prediction on the entire graph. So what this means is we have to take the individual node embeddings, right, for every node, and somehow aggregate them to, to find the embedding of the graph so that we can then make a prediction, right? So in this sense, this uh, head for graph uh, prediction, graph level prediction is similar to the aggregation function in a GNN layer, right? We need to aggregate all these embeddings of nodes to create a graph level embedding and then make a graph level uh, prediction. So let me tell you how you can define this uh, graph uh, prediction head. There are many options uh, for us to do this. So one is to do global mean pooling, right? So basically you take the embeddings of all the nodes and you average them. That would be one possibility. Another possibility is max pooling, where you would take, take coordinate wise maximum across the embeddings of all the nodes. Um, and then another option is that you do summation based pooling, where you basically just sum up the embeddings of all the nodes uh, in the graph. Um, and this will, depending on the application and depending on the graph, uh, graphs you are working with, 
uh, different uh, options are going to work uh, uh, better. You know, mean pooling is interesting because the number of nodes does not really play the role. So if you, if you want to compare graphs that have very different uh, sizes, then perhaps mean pooling is the best option. But if you really want to also understand how many nodes are there in the graph and what is the structure of the graph, then sun-based pooling uh, is a better option. Um, of course, there are also more advanced uh, graph uh, pooling uh, strategies. And I'm just going to give you next an idea uh, how, uh, how you can improve this. Um, the reason why we may want to improve this is that the issue is that global pooling over a large graph will use a lot of information. Um, and I want to illustrate what I mean by this is by, with this simple toy example, where you can think that we have nodes that have only one dimensional embeddings, right? So the embeddings are just a single number. And imagine I have two graphs. In one case, you know, I have the values like minus one, node one has embedding minus one, node two has embedding minus two, node three is zero, you know, four has embedding one, and five has embedding uh, two. And perhaps I have a different graph um, where embeddings are very different, right? It's like minus 10, minus 20, zero, 10, and 20. Right? And I can say, look, clearly, G1 and G2 have very different node embeddings. Their structures could be very, very different. But if I do any kind of global sum-based pooling, for example, if I sum or if I take the average, then for both of these, um, um, I will get the same value. So it means that from the graph embedding point of view, these two, no these two graphs will have the same embedding value, so they'll have the same representation, so we cannot differentiate, we cannot separate them out, we cannot classify them into two different classes because they have the same representation. They both have the, uh, the representation uh, of zero. So this is one issue, kind of uh, uh, a very simple uh, kind of edge case example um, why, why global pooling uh, many times can lead to unsatisfactory results, especially if the graphs are uh, larger. A solution to this is to do a hierarchical pooling. And hierarchical pooling would mean that I don't aggregate everything together at the same time, but I'm aggregating smaller groups, and then, you know, I take a few nodes, aggregate them, I take another subset of nodes, aggregate them, now I have two aggregations, I further aggregate this, and this way I can hierarchically uh, aggregate things, uh, subsets of nodes together. So let me give you a, a toy example, and then I'll tell you about how one can do this. Um, so imagine I will be going to aggregate using a, a rectified linear unit as a non um, as a nonlinearity and a summation as the aggregation function, right? And imagine that I decide to aggregate hierarchically in a sense that I first aggregate first two nodes, then I aggregate the last three nodes, and then I aggregate the aggregates, right? So uh, for uh, graph one, how will this look like? Is I first aggregate minus one and minus two. Um, and then pass it through ReLU, I get a zero. Then I aggregate the last uh, three nodes. Uh, here's the aggregation, I get a value of three. Now I aggregate zero and the three together, and I obtain a three. So this means the embedding of this graph G1 is three, because we work with single dimensional embeddings, right? Now for G2, here is my, uh, here's my graph, right? So again, if I do the, I, if I do the first two nodes, the ReLU will be zero. If I do the second, uh, the last three nodes, the, uh, the ReLU output of this aggregation will be 30. If I now further aggregate this using the same aggregation uh, function, so I aggregate 0 and a 30, um, I will get uh, a 30. So now the two graphs have very different embeddings. One has an embedding of 3, the other one of 30. So we are able now to differentiate them, right? We are able to distinguish them because they have different embeddings. They, they do not overlap in the embedding space. So that's an idea or an illustration how hierarchical pooling uh, may help. So now, of course, the question is, uh, how do I decide who tells me what to aggregate first and how to hierarchically aggregate? And the insight that allows you to do this really well in graphs is that graphs tend to have what is called community structure, right? If you think of social networks, there are tightly knit communities inside social networks. So the idea would be that if I can detect these communities ahead of time, then I can aggregate nodes inside communities into, let's say, community embeddings, 
and then I can further aggregate community embeddings into super community embeddings and so on and so forth hierarchically. This would be one strategy, would basically be to apply what is called a community detection or a graph partitioning algorithm to split the graph into different uh, clusters, denoted here by these different uh, colors, and then aggregate inside each of the cluster, each of the communities, and then keep to, to create basically for each community a super node. This is now an aggregated embedding of all the members of the community. And then I could again look how communities link to each other, uh, aggregate based on that, get another super node and keep aggregating until I get uh, to the prediction head, right? And uh, one option, as I said, to do this is, would be to simply apply a graph partitioning, graph clustering, community detection uh, algorithm to identify what are the clusters in the graph, what are these densely connected groups, and then you would, you know, do this at, in the level of the original network, then you would do this again at level one, you do this at level two, until you have a single super node, which you then can input into a prediction head. Uh, what is interesting is that you can do this actually in a way so that you learn how to partition the network, right? You don't need to download some external software and make this assumption that, you know, communities are important. What you can do, and there's a paper linked up here called a diff pool, because this is kind of differential pooling operator that allows you to learn how to aggregate nodes in the network. And the simple idea how to do this is to have two independent graph neural networks uh, at each uh, level here. And one graph neural network is going to compute node embeddings. This is uh, standard, what you have talked so far. But what is clever is that we will also have a second graph neural network that will compute the clusters that nodes belong to. So what I mean by this is it will determine which nodes should belong to the same uh, cluster, which nodes should be aggregated uh, together, which embedding should be aggregated together to create this uh, super node. And the cool thing is that you can train GNNs A and B at each level together in parallel. So this means that you can supervise how to cluster the network and how to aggregate the, the network, inform the node embedding information to, to come up with the optimal way to embed uh, the underlying network. So this is kind of the most advanced way how you can, how you can learn to hierarchically pull uh, the network in order in order to make a uh, good faithful embedding uh, of the entire network. So uh, this is what I wanted to uh, uh, show in this case. Now that we have talked about prediction heads, let's talk about actually the predictions uh, and the labels. So the second uh, part I want to talk about uh, is this part here, which, which is about uh, predictions and labels. So um, we can broadly distinguish between supervised and unsupervised uh, learning. Supervised learning on graphs would be where uh, labels come from some external sources. Perhaps, for example, nodes have belong to different classes. Users in social network, uh, you know, uh, are interested in different topics. Uh, if you have graphs, molecules, perhaps every molecule, you know, we know whether it's toxic or not not or we know how is it its drug likeness which is something that chemists uh, worry about right this is supervised basically supervision labels come from the outside and then there is also the notion of unsupervised learning on graphs where the signal the supervision comes from the graph itself an example of this would be for for example a link prediction task right where you want to predict whether a pair of nodes is connected here we don't need any external information. All we need is just um, pairs of nodes that are connected and pairs of nodes that are not connected. Um, and sometimes the difference between supervised and unsupervised is blurry because both you can formulate as an optimization tasks. And in both you kind of still have supervision, uh, just in some cases supervision is external and sometimes supervision is uh, internal, right? So, um, you know, uh, for example, if you train a GNN uh, to predict node clustering coefficient, you would kind of call this unsupervised learning on graphs because the supervision is not external. 
And sometimes unsupervised learning is also called self-supervised, right? Basically, it's the data that, set, that the, the, the input data gives you the, the supervision to the model. So a link prediction task is an example of a self-supervised uh, learning task, right? Where basically we take the unlabeled data, but still define supervised prediction tasks based on the structure um, of that data. So um, let me first talk about supervised uh, labels on graphs. So supervised labels come from specific use cases. Um, and let me give you a few examples, right? For node labels, you know, you could say, oh, in a citation network, perhaps a, a subject area that a node, that a paper belongs to, that's my external label. It's defined for every node. Uh, for example, in um, uh, in uh, link prediction for pairwise uh, prediction tasks, for example, in a transaction network, um, I could have the label Y to, for every transaction to tell me whether that transaction is fraudulent or not, right? I have some external entity that tells me, verifies every transaction and says which ones are fraudulent and which ones are not. So that could be the label. Is it fraudulent or not? And you know, for entire graphs, for example, if I work with molecules, as I said, drug likeness or uh, uh, toxicity would be an example of an externally defined uh, label that we can now predict for the entire graph for the entire uh, molecule. Um, and you know, uh, one, one advice is, is that to reduce your task to a node, edge, or a graph uh, labeling task, since these tasks are standard and easy to work with, right? So um, what this means is that sometimes your machine learning modeling task will, will come in as a, a, not as a node classification task or as a link prediction task. But if you can formulate it as one of these three tasks, this means, means that you can reuse a lot of existing research and you can reuse um, a lot of existing methodology and uh, architectures, right? So, uh, having, for, casting the prediction tasks in terms of these three fundamental graph level tasks definitely helps because it's uh, easy, because you can lean on a lot of uh, prior work and prior uh, research. So now that we talked about supervised tasks, let's talk about unsupervised signals on graphs. Um, the, the idea here is that sometimes we only have a graph and we don't have any external labels. Um, and the solution here is to define self-supervised uh, learning tasks, right? So the models will still be, uh, be the same, they will still be the loss, just the supervision signal will come from the input graph itself. So what are some examples of this? For example, for node level tasks, you could say, let me predict statistics such as node clustering coefficient or page rank. Uh, perhaps what one option would also be that if you work with molecule, molecular graphs, maybe you would say, let me predict what type of atom uh, is a given node, right? Is it a hydrogen? Is it a carbon? Um, uh, is it oxygen? That would be one way of a self-supervised task in a sense that you are trying to predict some attribute, some property uh, of that node. Um, for ring prediction, for ed let edge level tasks, a uh, very natural way to self-supervise is to hide a couple of edges and then say, can I predict whether a pair of nodes is connected or not, right? Can I predict whether there should be a link or not? And that's a level of so self-supervision. And then for graph level tasks, uh, again, we can think of different graph statistics. For example, we can say, are two graphs isomorphic? Um, you know, what kind of uh, motifs graphlets uh, do two graphs uh, have? Um, and you could use this as a way uh, to supervise uh, at the graph level, right? Um, and notice that in all these uh, tasks that I defined now, we don't require any external ground truth uh, labels. We just use the graph structure information and whatever um, is the input uh, data. So now that we talked about uh, uh, predictions uh, and labels, now let's discuss the loss function and, um, and talk about you know, what kind of loss functions would I use to measure discrepancy between the prediction and the labels uh, so that I can then optimize this loss function and basically back propagate all the way down to the parameters of the graph neural network uh, um, model. So the setting is the following. Uh, we have n data points and each data point can either be an individual node, an individual graph, uh, or an individual edge. So for node level prediction, we'll say, aha, each node 
uh, has a ha node i has a label, uh, and here's the predicted label. Uh, for edge level, again, we'll say each edge uh, has a each potential edge has a label, and we are going to predict that label. Label could be does the edge exist or not? Maybe it's the type of the edge, whether it's fraudulent or not, and so on. And similarly, last right for uh, graph level, I'm denoting this as g. You know, for each graph, we have the true label, the true value versus the predicted value. And I'm going to use this notation y hat and y to refer to the prediction. Uh, to the prediction uh, predicted value and the true value, and I'll, I'm going to omit the superscript, uh, sorry, the subscript, so that will basically the, to denote what uh, prediction, specific prediction task we are talking about. Because at the end, y is just an output, and I can now uh, work with these outputs and compare the y hat uh, versus y. So uh, an important distinction is, are we doing classification or are we doing regression? Uh, classification means that labels y uh, uh, have discrete categorical uh, values, right? Um, it would be, you know, what topic does the user like? Uh, while in regression, we are predicting continuous values. You know, want to predict drug likeness of a molecule or toxicity level of a molecule, right? Binary prediction would be, or classification would be, is it toxic or not? Regression would be predict the toxicity level. Um, and GNNs can be applied to both of these settings, to classification as well as to regression. Um, and the difference will be between classification and regression is essentially in the loss function and the, uh, in the evaluation metric. So let me first tell you about classification loss. The most popular classification loss is called cross entropy. We have already talked about this in lecture six, where basically the idea is if I'm doing a K-way prediction for i data point, then uh, cross entropy between the true label and the predicted label y hat is simply a sum over um, uh, all these k different classes, uh, the y uh, value of the, at that class uh, for uh, i data point times the log uh, predicted uh, class value. And y hat you can interpret as a probability. Um, and the way this basically works is to, to say the following, right? You can imagine that my uh, y is uh, like this, so this is now a binary vector that tells that my um, particular, let's say, node belongs to class number three. So it is a one hot label encoding. And then, you know, the y hat would now be um, a vector, a, a distribution. Perhaps we can apply, we applied softmax to it. So it means that all these entries sum to one. And this now you can interpret as the probability that uh, y is of um, class number uh, number um, three, and the idea is if you look at this equation, right? Because the 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 predicted probability the probabilities will sum to one. What we want is that um, wherever there is a value of uh, the true class is is not uh, here, we want the probability there to be very high because zero times anything is zero. So we want uh, it, uh, we want the uh, probabilities uh, to, be, to be low here because log something close to zero gives me a high negative value, but if I multiply it with zero, it doesn't matter. So I would wanna uh, predict low numbers here, but wherever the, the value is one, I wanna predict a high probability because um, here I'll be multiplying with one, but log of something that is close to one is, uh, is zero. So again, the cross entropy loss the discrepancy in this case will be small. So basically this, this loss will force the predicted values uh, to the to other classes that uh, uh, data point i does not belong to, to have low values and where whatever class it belongs to, it will force it to have high value. Uh, that's the idea because if this is one, I want this second term to be as small as possible. The way I make it small is to make it as close to one as possible, right? Remember, that these entries have to sum to one. And this is now loss defined at a single data point i. So the total loss is simply a sum over all the data points and then the cross entropy uh, loss for each individual data point. So this is in terms of classification loss, uh, the most popular one. For regression loss, um, what is a standard loss is called mean squared error or, or uh, equivalently also known as the L2 loss. And essentially what we are doing, we are saying, aha, uh -huh, if I have a k-way prediction task, I'm trying to predict k real values for a given node uh, i, 
I'm simply summing over all the k and I'm taking the discrepancy between the true value minus the predicted value and I square that so that this will always be positive. And basically the idea is, right, the, the loss will take the smallest value when y and y hat are as aligned as possible. So when these differences are as, as small as possible. And the reason why we like to take the quadratic loss here is because it's smooth, it's continuous, uh, it's easy to take derivative of, um, it's always positive, um, a lot of kind of nice uh, properties. So again, this is a loss, uh, mean squared error loss uh, on, on, a, on a pair, on one data point, and now over, if I have n training examples, then I simply sum up the losses of individual uh, data points. And this is now the, the loss on the entire uh, data set. So this is in terms of classification and regression loss. There are also other losses that uh, we like to use. For example, there are these losses called maximum margin losses that are very useful if you don't care about um, predicting a binary value or a regression, but you care about the node ordering. Perhaps you want to sort the nodes according to, according to some value. And the idea is that what you care is for the nodes to be sorted properly and you don't care so much what exact values they have. You want to know who are the top k nodes. In this case, you would use some kind of triplet based loss is called because you want to enforce one node to be ranked higher than, um, than the other node, or you would be using um, some kind of much max margin uh, types loss. So now that we talked about loss functions, uh, let's also talk about uh, evaluation metrics. So for evaluation metrics, um, we, I, for how we evaluate regression is that we generally compute what is called uh, the mean squared, squared uh, error. Um, and the way this is defined is, again, it's the square difference between the predicted value and true value. You, you, you take the average, so you uh, divide by the total number of data points, and then you take the square root. So this is kind of analogous to the, uh, uh, to the L2 uh, loss that you optimize, this is now uh, how you report performance uh, of your model. You can also do mean absolute error, where now you just take dif absolute differences and divide uh, by the number of data points. Um, if you look into sklearn, so the scikit-learn Python package that all of us will be using during the class, uh, there is a lot of different uh, metrics uh, already uh, implemented there, and here I just give you uh, two most common ones. Uh, for classification, uh, you can, uh, what is a very standard way to report is what is called classification accuracy, where basically you just say what number of times did my predicted uh, variable, uh, predicted class match the true class. And you say what fraction of times did I cor correctly predict the class. Uh, this is nice a metric if your classes are um, about balance. Balanced meaning that, I don't know, half of the data points is positive and half is negative. If you have very imbalanced classes, imagine that you only have 1% uh, uh, positive uh, class uh, data points and 99% are negative, then the problem with accuracy is that it's very easy to get high accuracy by just predicting a negative class all the time, right? So if, I, if I'm, for example, um, if I have the case where I say, is a fr transaction fraudulent or not? And let's say 99% of transactions are non-fraudulent, then my, my, I can get very high accuracy of 99% if my classifier always says uh, non-fraudulent, right? So this is the problem with accuracy is that if classes are imbalanced, then trivial classifiers may have very high um, uh, accuracy. So uh, to get more, uh, to go deeper and, and to deal with some of these issues, um, there are other metrics that are more sensitive to this decision. What do, we, that, what do we call as positive and what do we call as negative? Because the, the models will usually output, let's say some probability, a value between zero and one, and we have to decide on the threshold to say everything above this threshold is positive, everything below the threshold uh, is negative. Um, and uh, uh, precision recall type metrics uh, uh, are one example to do this. Um, and there is also the uh, ROC AUC, so the area under the receiver operating characteristic that I'm also going to uh, discuss and talk about. So first is, if you want to know more than just accuracy, then what you can define is this notion of a, what is called confusion matrix, where you basically say, aha, 
what is the predicted value? Is it predicted positive or negative? Ver versus what is the actual, the true value? Is it positive or negative? And then you can count how many examples, how many data points are each in, uh, in each of these four cells, right? When you correctly predict negative, you, you do plus one here. When you correctly predict ne uh, positive, you do a plus one here because predicted an actual match. And then you can make two uh, types of mistakes called uh, false positives. These are uh, examples where you predicted positive, but they are actually negative. And you then also have false negatives where uh, you predicted negative, but the class is actually positive. So uh, accuracy is simply true positives plus true negatives divided by the sum uh, of all of them. So this is here, right? It's the number of data points. Precision, it's called out of all, um, it says how many true positives are there. And I normalize this by true positives and false positives. So pre precision says out of all the positive predictions I made, what fraction of them are true? And then recall says, um, it says again, true positives, but I divide by true positives and false negatives, right? So I'm basically saying out of all positive uh, examples in the data set, how many did I actually predict positive, right? So recall says out of all positives in the data set, how many I have predicted positive? And precision is out of predicted positives, how many are actually positive? Um, and then you can combine precision and recall into, some, into a single metric that is called uh, F1 score, uh, defined as two times precision times recall divided by precision plus recall. This formula is a harmonic mean of precision and recall. That's why uh, uh, it is defined this way. This is a harmonic mean or harmonic average of precision and recall. Uh, in information retrieval, in uh, text mining, people like to use uh, F1 score uh, a lot. And then the last uh, evaluation metric that I want to talk about is uh, ROC AUC. So basically a receiver operating characteristic or a receiver operating characteristic curve. And this measures the trade-off between the true positive rate and what is called the false positive rate. Um, and true positive rate is really recall and false positive rate is divided by false positives divided by false positives plus true uh, negatives. And the way you usually write it is that you, 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 you draw true posi a false positive rate versus true positive rate. And, and this um, evaluation matrix comes from the field of uh, medicine, where basically you, s rather than thinking of it as who is, I don't know, who is sick or not, or you can kind of think of it as you sort people by risk of having a disease. And now you can imagine uh, asking, uh -huh, I will take top two, top three, top four. And you ask how good is the top, how good, how clean are the to top K candidates? Because this classification threshold that determines who, what, what points are positive and what points are negative in some sense is uh, arbitrary. And uh, what is interesting, if you uh, take the positive and negative examples and randomly sort them, then, the, then you would get this uh, true positive versus false positive rate, it will be a straight line. So a random classification will give you a straight line. And then um, if you do better classification than random, then uh, this, uh, this particular line is going to approach uh, kind of more and more uh, this top corner here. So if, if it would be a perfect classification, basically it would go up immediately and then remain flat. So the, uh, the metric that people like to use to to uh, characterize the performance of a classifier is the area under the ROC curve, right? So a random classif classifier will have the area of 0.5 because it covers half of this square and a perfect classifier would have an area uh, of one. So ROC AUC is the area under this uh, ROC curve. This, uh, this is called the ROC curve. And uh, the higher the area, the better the classifier. Uh, an, a random classifier has an area of 0.5. So 0.5 is not good, 0.5 is bad. It's basically random. Um, one intuition what the uh, area under the AUC, uh, the uh, uh, ROC curve tells me is it tells me the probability that if you pick two, uh, a positive and a negative point at random, what's the probability that a positive point will be ranked higher than a negative point? So if it's one, this means you gave a perfect classification, all the positive points are ranked above all the negatives. 
And if you give a random classification, then the probability that the positive is above a negative is, is half because uh, it's random, right? So um, this is one intuition about the AUC uh, curve. So um, we have talked about the training pipeline today, um, about uh, how do we define the prediction head, we talked about the evaluation metrics, we talked about where the labels come from, and we talked about the loss function. What we are going to talk about uh, next week is we are actually going to talk about how do you set up training? How do you do training? How do you set up the data sets? How do you split your data between test valuation um, and um, uh, training data sets to be able to do uh, efficient uh, training and to get uh, good results?